Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today it's my pleasure to welcome my good friend Donnie Nufus. We've known each other for a very long time. He's got deep insights on building community in esports, how to disrupt industries with technology, and he talks about his love of hip hop. Join me in talking to Donnie. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC DLC Drop Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome my very good friend, longtime friend, Donnie Newfis, to the platform. Welcome, my friend. Hey, thank you so much, friend. John friend uh, for uh, inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here, man. And I got to say kudos to you, man. Uh, your episodes and your guests have been stellar. So I don't Thank know you. what the heck I'm doing here. <laughs> that makes two of us, my man, you know, um, you know, the native Americans, when they would weave these bowls, just, to, yeah. just to, to prove that they were handmade because they were so good at they would purposely put one flaw in the bowl. <laughs> and I don't want to say that this episode is the flaw being the 52nd episode, the last episode of our first year, but you just take that and run with it however you want. You know what? I'll take what I can get. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of people who who know you and I John and would 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 uh, agree with you wholeheartedly on that on that analysis there. Fantastic. But- well, I will say I appreciate the, the the kind words about the podcast, and I would say that this podcast may may not exist if you and I had not met about five years ago, because you were one of the people that really I think helped me understand the opportunity in esports and right. understand where this could go, and give me a lot of direction at the very beginning, um, yeah. which is then you know taking us down similar paths and. <laughs> some different paths as well I, I i mean i do remember it very vividly where where uh um uh, i believe a, a colleague of mine had met a colleague of yours when you were at gamestop at some uh, convention meeting convention or whatever yeah and um struck up a conversation i believe it was the the lady who did all the trade shows for game stops and meetings and all that right and uh, my colleague just happened to know that i was running esports uh at the company i was at at the time and said it was basically you two should talk to each other and uh i remember you calling me and it was just an instant um uh, just instantly got along with you just really similar sense of humor yeah. um down to earth and you know it was really funny because it was one of these things where you were like you know i'm trying to understand this esports thing and i said yeah so am i <laughs> like yeah i mean you know and it was more of a well what do you know and it's like what do you know and it, it turned out that we actually between the two of us, you know, <laughs> knew, knew enough, but um, it's amazing if you think back then of where we were, right? And what we knew and- About five years ago, yeah. Yeah, and today, like, man, uh, what a difference time makes in it. But, um, you know, it's, <clears throat> and it's also incredible. I mean, just your story too alone of what you've been able to do Um, because, you know, I, you know, you and I have said many, many times that the, you know, the part that esports was missing was the people who didn't come from esports, right? It's the, it's the, it's, uh, what you brought in your expertise from being from marketing arm and being at a big corporation like GameStop. And there's this, this whole other subsection of people who aren't necessarily what I will say, uh, gamers as they are more business and marketing and, you know, understand how business works and bringing that discipline to this industry that needed it sorely because it was such a grassroots industry, um, you know, and how much it has now evolved where you are seeing people like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, Ann Han who came from the, you know, BP right. and now is super league gaming, you know, like seeing these people who understand the business side of things. Cause there are just some things that reign true 
and adding that expertise to it to allow this to grow as an industry. It's uh, and you're one of those people. I mean, you are definitely one of those people that you've contributed so much to this industry and so much great insight from, you know, your skating days to your media days to, you know, everything. And it's <clears throat> what a great, uh, what a great ecosystem that's being created by some pretty amazing individuals, right? There are a lot of amazing individuals and you are one of them, my friend. <laughs> um, and let's not forget that this episode is about you. It's not about me. I get to uh, be on I every know. episode. Cause I'm that's, true. So, that's true. That's <laughs> true. Um, but to give people a little bit of background, um, you kind of teased the story there about how we met. Uh, Donnie was at Production Resource Group, PRG, which is mm -hmm. a company that I work with nowadays. And Donnie actually set me up for success um, <laughs> for that job. So thank you for that. But what I want to talk about a little bit before we really get started here is what you're doing now. And so <laughs> you are now the Director of Business Development and Strategic Partnerships for Sonic Foundry. Yes. Tell us what that means and what Sonic, Sonic Foundry is really focusing on. Yeah, well, this is, <clears throat> believe it or not, this is uh, week three of being at Sonic Foundry, but it's week three of my second go around. So mm -hmm. um, my whole career got started uh, basically because of this company. Um, so Sonic Foundry is a company that's been around 30 years. And the, um, the founder of the company, Monty Schmidt, was uh, a guy who in his um, basement invented one of the first two channel audio editors for PC back in the 90s. Wow. And from there had several different software it created the first, you know, looping uh, beat making DAW systems called Acid Pro and Vegas and mm -hmm. all these, <clears throat> these uh, softwares that were revolutionary for music going from analog to digital, right? Um, and the company since then has matured quite a bit and has gotten into the rich media space. And now, you know, the the majority of what we do is we work in the uh, enterprise video space for streaming, you know, um, both on demand and live, but in, handling large, large amounts of content and integrating it into other platforms and yada, yada, I could go on and on, but, but really it, it all revolves around, you know, content. Um, and you know, the whole reason I got the gig at PRG, um, for doing esports is because our friend Jens knew two things about me. He knew that I came from the streaming industry. And that's kind of a big deal in esports. Yep. And he also knew I played a lot of video games. <laughs> and, and that, did did Jens know that you rented Camaros when you went on business trips? Because that's what you picked me in, in L, up in LA. And I think he, that alone may have been what started our friendship at the level. He of not only knew it, but he encouraged <laughs> it. You know, Amazing. I'm not sure if you've ever driven with Jens, but he he likes to drive fast. So I have not yet, but. Um, <laughs> Little yeah. Update your insurance. So, I mean, he, uh, you know, so, so that was the thing that was the premise because they're like, wow, there's a lot of streaming going on, right? There's yeah. a lot, a lot of streaming happening with this esports thing. Maybe we can, you know, put some cameras there and some encoders and stuff like that. And, you know, and as, and it's funny, you know, it's funny to look back on that. And that was basically people who didn't come from esports. That was their understanding of like, for instance, a production company, there's like, well, there's a whole bunch of lights and screens and, you know, maybe we can provide lights and screens. What they didn't understand is esports, kind of like pro skating, it's a way of life. It is, right. it is a culture. It is a community. And, you know, I, I you know, I've, I've said this before, but it was the, it was the first social media. I mean, I was <clears throat> back in the nineties, uh, on my Amiga 500 connecting via a, um, you know, I think it was, I think I had a 2400 baud modem mm -hmm. onto BBSs and chatting with people that we would literally, meet, li literally later on meet up somewhere, but we were all, yeah. you know, chatting or playing online games with my friend across the street. And we were chatting to each other. It's, uh, it's interesting because right now, um, with some friends and former colleagues, we're all playing new world mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm back in the MMO again. Right. And I'm part of a guild 
uh, uh, there's a, there's about a hundred of us called, uh, the lost company and, um, uh, sorry, uh, the lost colony. Um, and it's amazing. Um, there's this one gentleman on their radar who's a retired guy in his seventies who's grinding with me. And then at the same time, there are kids who are in their twenties who are, you know, grinding along with radar and I, and I'm, you know, I'm 43 and, and my kids in the background are playing Minecraft, but we we all, I, you know, I know that radar was sick recently and I was checking in with how you doing, how you feeling, how's that truck you bought running. We're talking to each other while we're playing in this environment, this world, you know, and becoming close and becoming friends. And it's that piece right there. Mm -hmm. That's the piece that people don't understand. Yeah. Cause it's, it's not What's about the game. Yeah. Big time, big time. And, and what's so amazing to me is th- the culture is now becoming more and more inclusive. It's it, of, there's yeah. no age discrimination. There's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more um, accepted to play well, video games. Well, I think like one thing that's happened is that people who have been gamers as children are now adults. Yeah. Right. So when people, uh, you see the average, I think esports enthusiast is 35 years old or something like that. And it's, I might be off a couple of years there, but there's a, a very good chunk of the audience that's a lot older than people think they are. Um, and so I really believe why there's, there's not really a big difference between ages is because you see the world the same way. You connect yeah. with each other on a foundational basis. And this is something I, I was at the skate park yesterday and I was skating with this kid who's 10 years old, a 10 year old boy. I'm 38. There's some other guys skating this bowl who are, I think in their late forties, early fifties. And then there's a bunch of, you know, kids, teens and twenties, but there's so much, I have so much in common with this 10 year old kid. Why? (laughs) Because the way we see the world and what we think about all day long and what we can relate to are the same things no matter how different the rest of our lives are. Right. That's exactly right. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the, the only thing that's a little different now is how, you know, us older gamers and all this stuff, we have grown up our whole lives with accepting this way of communicating with each other. This like, you know, I, I, I honestly probably watch more Twitch and YouTube gaming than I do regular TV, Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, I was just reading um, that uh, by the end of this year, 85% of the total traffic for the internet is going to be streaming video. And 85% of the total internet is going to be video streaming video is that's where the bandwidth is going to be consumed. That's insane. You know, so I think what <laughs> a lot of people who are looking at things like esports they're trying to figure this out because first of all there's a lot of noise, you know, there's 500 hours just in YouTube alone of content uploaded every minute. Uh wow. there, there's there are so many platforms, there's so many content creators, there's so, I mean there's there's so much noise out there, right? But yet, my son, who's six years old, is transfixed by certain YouTube <clears throat> content creators of Minecraft. Yeah. Just, just completely, and then, like, talks to me about it, and this person did this, and then they did, and, like, I remember I was talking, I was talking to a friend, I said, you know one thing my kids are never going to understand? Saturday morning cartoons. You had one day during a certain block of time yeah. that that was the only time you got to watch your content, <laughs> like as a kid. Good point. You know, and now it is so prevalent, is so it's so easily accessible. And, and it's funny because, I mean, especially, you know, especially with people who are looking at esports and looking at the numbers of the people who are attending and the people who are watching online. Um, when you look at all the other industries, when you look at, uh, I'll just take, for instance, corporate training, right? Or okay. like, um, 
you know, uh, product launches or, or anything else that might use like video. Right. Right. Um, all these people are like, I look at esports, I see how engaged they are. How do I make my content more engaging? How do I do things to make it more engaging? Mm-hmm. And people will be like, well, what if we add like polls or what if we had, you know, like uh, chat or what if we do like, they, all these things they keep trying to throw at it. <clears throat> and I always like using this example. I always like using the example, do you by any chance, John, know the most expensive event to attend in the world and how much that ticket is? In the world? Yes. Um, I, maybe an F1 event in Monaco or something like that? I, I'm not so, sure. so the most expensive ticket for an event is a quarter million dollars to buy the ticket. To, in order to get the ticket, you actually have to apply and be approved to even buy it. Now, this same organization records all of their content and they put it on YouTube for free. Is it all Ted? of it? It's Ted. It's Ted. And Crazy. so the reason that is, is because, and it's the same reason why esports resonates with audiences, it's because the content. The one thing that engages an audience more than anything is content they care about. <laughs> That's relatable to them, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like they they want, this is content that they enjoy to watch or that is so well curated, like Ted, that is so well done and so interesting. Even if you don't know the thing, a thing about like hydrodynamics, that speaker and the story that they tell is yeah. so fascinating that you go, oh my God, you got to see this. This is, this is great. And I think that's the thing too, that is another part that people are missing because they're, they're going, oh, they're just playing video games. Like I don't watch Dr. Disrespect because he plays video games alone. I mean, he's pretty good. But he is so entertaining. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's my favorite. I love that dude. He's so entertaining. He's so you know? over the top. I love. So over the top. Uh, and then the relationships that he has with Timmy, and then with Nick, and like you know this all all this like the drama going on the and the back and forth. You yeah. know, it's just now. Granted, they're very good at what they do. They're very good at these games, and I look at what they do and I go, I, right. there's no way I could do that. But they're just as content creators, it's not about them just playing the game. There's so much more there. Well, and especially with Dr. Disrespect, the, the, the two time back to back. Two time. Yeah. 1993, <laughs> 1994 blockbuster world champ. I, yeah. I got his memoir and I've been listening to it while I do uh, yard work outside and it's absolutely hilarious. But anywho, that's yes. awesome. Well, the, th- the thing with him that I was going to comment on is his production value is way above Way everybody above. else and what's interesting yes. to me about that is uh i mean the streaming audience typically does not require a high level a high quality of content because it Correct. started with just you know the 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 camera on your laptop or on your pc right. and right. gamers have been innovators in how content is consumed yes. but because of that the content has been lower quality and that has increased through time but I mean, one thing like I was telling PRG in COVID when they're like, okay, how do we lean into streaming? And PRG's whole thing is innovation and high quality and all these things. I was like, guys, the bad news is, you know, the audience doesn't require some premium solution here. They just require to watch their players and to be able to chat with them. Right. You're so right. Yes. The doc differentiates himself with, just i mean the graphics the motion intro like all these things i love it it's so well it's so well done yes and you know you bring up a really great point too because when i first got into the streaming industry it was a novelty i mean this was 14 years ago and like somebody being able to take an encoder and put live video on the internet that was nobody was doing it it was like it was a very difficult thing, a very niche thing. People thought it was a very niche, you know, type of business because video had not progressed, especially live, you know, had not progressed that much. Now, today, one of the most, I would say, robust and best live streaming pieces of software that exists is OBS, which is 100% free. 
completely uh, free. I mean, it's probably what Doc uses, honestly, mm-hmm. for <laughs> to run all their stuff. Completely community supported, built. It is like you go to like, you know, Intel Extreme Masters and you'll see sometimes like some of the big streamers are using this piece of free software. The other thing too is the discipline or the knowledge of how to go live on the internet. Again, used to be one of these things that was very few people knew how to do it. Today, I can get a very qualified streaming technician who's 15 years old in their basement and they can use something like an Elgato from Best Buy as their encoder with the laptop and be streaming, you know, high def in a matter of minutes. So like that whole, like the technology to your point, it's just like, we have gone so far and a lot of that is due to what esports did. I mean, if you would have said two, 14 years ago, Best Buy is gonna be selling content capture and streaming devices for kids to buy, I've been like, you're nuts, you're crazy. Like right. now it's just commonplace. Right. Right. It's just common. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, it's it's I think like, you know, you know, I think like in like my previous job working in, I was working in, you know, virtual and augmented reality and all this stuff. Sure. When we were talking with organizations, I wasn't telling everybody to go out and buy a headset or everybody to go out and get streaming and learn how to stream. But, you know, there's these things called indicators. <laughs> and esports is an indicator of all of these kids and the way that they are creating and immersing themselves and communicating with content yeah. that is slowly just kind of like how I grew up with video games. Now video games is a pretty accepted thing. You're not a geek anymore. Right. A lot of these other disciplines are going to work their ways into the professional space. There's going to be eventually an expectation Mm -hmm. that organizations understand how to communicate in a similar manner, similar fashion because that's how this younger generation is doing it. And they will eventually get jobs and they will infiltrate all these organizations. And I, so I think that's, that's another thing that like with, with esports that when people are trying to figure this thing out, it's just, you know, look at the behavior and, and understand how that behavior is going to eventually be a behavior that's going to be in your organization that you're, you're going to have to know how to manage. Right. Yeah. It, it, it reminds me of a, a time when you and I were actually speaking on a panel. Um, I think it was Capital Factory in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if you remember, but the last question that people asked us, they said, is esports a sport? I remember <laughs> your answer was unequivocally yes, absolutely. And my answer, uh, which I'll refer to here, um, <laughs> was it doesn't matter. You know, in fact, I'm not a big fan of the term esports because it it instantly uh, agree yeah creates this debate of whether it is a sport or not, and it's yeah. a weird word. And how do you capitalize yeah. it? All the things. I prefer competitive gaming because it just Agreed. kind of makes things a lot more sense. But to go to yes. my point here is, it doesn't matter if esports is a sport or not; it is the future of entertainment. Yes, one hundred percent. Uh, not only that, not, not only of entertainment, but connection. I'll, g- I'll give a, I'll give you an example. So, um, as you know, I, I produce music, right? I do music on my, um, on my, on my side right. and in Twitch, I have found communities of producers, other producers, music producers mm-hmm. that basically you can submit your music and they can do a review of it and they can be like, Hey, I would, you know, mix this or, you know, and some of these people are just kids who just like music who want to give an opinion. And some of them are legit producers. Sure. Um, so there's one community that I'm part of, uh, uh, stay on beats or stay on beat, which is on, on Twitch. And he's, uh, he's this producer out of Miami and has a bunch of other really talented producers there that, I originally started watching it as entertainment to hear what people were producing music they were making. And then one day I got the courage to submit a song and I submitted a song 
and I got a really great uh, constructive feedback, great feedback. So yeah. then I submitted another song and submitted another. Um, I just, and you heard it, I sang it last week. Yeah. Uh, I collaborated with one of the, one of the other artists from that community and did a song together. And yeah. now, awesome. you know, I'm, I'm connected on Instagram with all of them and we all share and we're all collaborating. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of these things where not only can you be entertained by it, but you can actually have relationship. And that's a right. crazy thing. If you think about it, like I wanted to be David Hasselhoff and Knight Rider so bad. The you second too? best thing was what if I could be his friend? Now, as much as I would talk to my, uh, you know, my TV, David would never talk back to me. That's different. We right. can actually have relationships, right? Right with these entertainers. I mean, there are people like um, Layer Cake on uh, Dr. Disrespect. I mean, he's a fan who has just been there from a, for a long time that Doc and him have now a relationship, right? Right. Um, I think that's the other part that's a little different here of that unfeathered access that we have to these people, right? Yeah, you essentially have had technology that creates or I would say enables the relatability to form into entertainment and also community as well. And, and what, how wonderful it is that not only that you find something you enjoy, but then you also find your people, right? Um, one of the guys I, I play new world with, uh, ACE, uh, Ace was a guy who used to watch my stream on Twitch, randomly found it on Twitch, became like a big fan, then became a modder and then all that stuff. Now we've known each other for years and him and I were just talking about it uh, this weekend. Like, my God, aren't we blessed that we found each other? Because I've, I've had some very personal conversations with him and, and some tough times and sure. vice versa. And he knows my kids and they say hello. Like ju they jump on the headset and say, hey, so, cool. you know, like, boy, that's pretty special, you know, <laughs> to, to, to have that. And again, you know, on the surface level, the, the, the SOS, the shiny object syndrome is people see the millions of users, uh, viewers, they see the, you know, the big productions and all that, but they, they don't really understand why. And that is really, in my opinion, the why that, that is something that's so personal and means so much. And, you know, the game is simply something that we're able to rally around that we all have a passion for, right. but we come there for the other people. I don't, I very rarely go online uh, and go into steam and play a game. That's just a one person game. I, j I only want to play when there's other people there who to play with. Right. It's all about the community. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. One of the things that I love uh, being a part of an agency or being able to be on the creative side is when you are involved in building that and then you see it in person. Yeah. Right. And so my favorite uh, project that I worked on while I was at the marketing arm before I joined GameStop was with AT&T. It was the Jordan Spieth fam fan dome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so what this was, it was a 30 foot dome and the whole inside of it was footage that we have shot of Jordan He's talking mm -hmm. about his life, how mm -hmm. AT&T integrates, and uh, how ultimately AT&T makes his, makes his life better. But it was this beautiful activation for Pebble Beach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing it. I didn't go in person to the Pebble Beach one, but I remember seeing it on the TV broadcast and just being amazed. And then yeah. he won. Yeah. He won the tournament. <laughs> so they got, their, they got their ROI on it then. Absolutely got their ROI on it. And then they moved it to the Byron Nelson in Dallas where I went in person. We were able to walk around, take my mom, my stepdad oh, there and cool. be like, I did this. This is, this is why I get a paycheck. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's funny you say that. It, uh, I, did, uh, I did some work and some creative content something for stuff that was at the NBA All-Stars. And uh, it was bef right before COVID hit. And I actually got to take my kids and my wife to see the activation in Chicago. And <laughs> after that, my, my daughter was telling everybody at elementary school, my daddy makes video games. And, uh, <laughs> so she didn't quite get it all, but you know, it was close enough. Uh, Made but cool. yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you've had a whole career of disrupting technology, or I should say no. using technology to disrupt industries. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about PRG. We can talk mm-hmm. a little bit more about what they do later in the episode. Yeah. We've learned about Bright Lion Interactive. But yeah. based on our conversations, we you've always been kind of one step ahead. And yeah. And so share with us uh, how that has manifested throughout your career. I wish I could say that it was done on purpose, but it, it wasn't. I've just kind of fell into it. But, you know, um, so I started out actually my first job. And by job, I mean, like, you get benefits, right? Um, my first I've job ever was, yeah. yeah, yeah, was working for um, a company called Broad Jam. And mm-hmm. what Broad Jam was, this was, this was right during the Napster days, right? Um, this was... Uh, early 2000s when there was this thing called the MP3 that everybody was starting to, you know, uh, play on their computers. The MP, MP what? I'm going to write that. The MP3. Okay. Yeah, I write it down for your notes uh-huh. there. Yeah. And uh, it, it was um, it was a company that was formed by um, a gentleman who came from the music industry, from the, from the um, A&R side. And basically, the way, way back in the day, let's say somebody was doing a movie or television, right? They would go to a publisher who owned the licensing on the music and they would say, I'm looking for a song that has 120 beats per minute. It's rock and roll and it has the word fire in it. And then what they would do is they would search through their catalogs of all the music that was kind of like that, uh, but it was all like uh, uh, in the paper or an Excel right. sheet or whatever. And they would take all the CDs of, of albums that had a song like that and they would, or cassette tapes, they'd put them in a box and they would ship them to the music supervisor. The music supervisor would take them out, listen to all of them, and then get back to the publisher and say, I'm going to license this song. So, And if you, if you look in the dictionary under the word unproductive, it spells <laughs> out that process yes. in detail. Yes. <laughs> so, Inefficient it also has the same definition. Yeah. So we, we had this crazy idea, hey, what if... I know this sounds nuts, but what if we use these MP3s and we put them online? Get and out we of made here. A, ser- a search engine so somebody could go in and could put like criteria, pull up all the songs, and then license it right online. And then we thought, hey, what if musicians could put their music online and sell their music and promote their albums and, and do things of that nature using web pages? Donnie, and, do you uh, think anybody's going to listen to music on the internet? So you know what the funny thing is, is we actually uh, back then had a meeting with Apple and uh, I actually uh, have a couple of uh, unfortunate like quotes where Apple I know is never going to hire me. But we had a meeting with Apple and uh, talked to their music division and they quite literally said no musician will ever put their music online. This is crazy. Nobody's going to want their music stolen because of Napster, blah, blah, blah. You're out of your mind. And then three years later, iTunes launched and the iPod came out. And so like, so it was, you know, it was a seismic shift. And obviously there was a lot of middle people making money there. So anywho, I was part of that industry for seven years. And then I went on to the streaming industry where I was trying to convince people that, hey, you should put your events online. You should live stream your events. Wait, you should are- allow people who can't be to the event to actually attend virtually. And uh, people said, why in the world would I do that? If, if I put it online, nobody will come to my event. I've got and I did that for seven years. As well. You know how convenient <laughs> that is? Because you get to watch it at 530 while you're driving home <laughs> and hope there's would, no traffic. <laughs> I, was, I was actually part of a really important project with the meetings and events industry where we did, it was over the course of about three years where we actually uh, tracked Uh, attendees who never came to an event and Mm. interface with it virtually. And then what happened after that and what they actually found out was by putting stuff online that they actually uh, generated an additional million dollars in revenue for the annual conference and had a 40% increase in attendance. And, and you know, the, the thing I always lead with people because with COVID with virtual events and everything and everybody doing that, do you know, that the most expensive event and hardest event to get into puts all of their sessions, all of their talks online on YouTube for free. And the most expensive ticket 
for this event that you actually have to apply to even pay the price is a quarter million dollars. Do you know what event that is? I do not. It's Ted. Mm. And so this whole this whole idea that all people had was like, oh, if we put our, our stuff online, you know, uh, nobody's going to come. It's it's not true. And, uh, you know, and then I go to PRG and I start doing this esports thing because it has streaming and video games and music and there all this go. other stuff. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious because, you know, it's a lot of fun to make jokes about people who didn't see what was coming next. Yeah. And partially because it's easy that yep. we're past it to look back and be like, ah, you idiots, you didn't know this. And it became a huge thing. But we <laughs> see this happen in every industry very yeah. commonly with yeah. companies that have been around 20, 30 years. Yeah. And, you know, I used to work at GameStop. Okay. That's one of the brands that um, a lot of people uh, would say, okay, that's in that group. Mm-hmm. And I always said, well, you know, t- GameStop at its peak was making $10 billion annually. Yeah. And it's a public company, so that's not confidential information. But if I built a company that made $10 billion annually, Donnie, you probably have a rough time telling me I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. That, well, that is correct. That's very correct. And yeah. so I think what we see with all of these companies and industries is we see them go to the top, but then they don't disrupt their own business. And I think somebody said, if you're not trying to cannibalize your own business, somebody else will do it for you. I can't remember who whose quote that would be assigned to. But what have you seen? Because you've had this vision, but you've been at companies that didn't see the vision. But is right. there something consistent that we can learn from going forward? I I think the <laughs> these insights that I gained was not because I hired a consulting agency. I didn't hire jo- I didn't have John. I didn't have you. I had to learn it the hard way. Mm. And we could have shortcutted a lot of this had we just not been stubborn and had like said, okay, we maybe not know. We, we perhaps put the ego at the door yeah. and, you know, allow somebody to come in to explain this and let's really listen. Um, Tyler, you know, at Brightline has a great quote. He says, everybody looks at something new through the lens of something old and they crazy. try to understand it through the business that they understand. And they most of the time miss the point. I'll give you the, uh, for instance, the business I'm in right now, augmented reality and virtual reality. Most people equate that to video games. Yeah. My son right. has an Oculus. Yeah. You know, he plays beat saber on it and they miss the whole point of what that technology is doing. What, mm-hmm. what it's enabling, how, for the first time in human history, we have a means of delivering content in the original form that our brain uh, thinks about content. When we read a book, we, we create pictures in our head, you know, <laughs> like sure. when, you know, and so, and so they miss all of that point. They just trivialize it. And as, as you know, John, these companies, I think, the most powerful thing that they can do is for them to say, I don't know. There's a lot of strength and power you can get from saying, I I don't know. I don't understand. And unfortunately, a lot of companies reach that point when it's too late. It's way too late Yeah. because somebody's already cannibalized their business because somebody who grew up natively in that, and that's, that's part of it too, I had the advantage of like, I did, I did what I, I, my passion in technology and I did what I did because I truly loved it and I was immersed in it. And I, you know, I, I, I understood it because when I wasn't at work, I was reading about it and I was learning and I was teaching myself about these technologies and setting up my own streaming studio and creating my own recording studio and, you know, and started recently building web apps uh, for web AR. Like I I'm curious about it. And I, I took the time to, to learn. N- yeah. Not everybody has that time, nor that appetite, nor really necessarily cares about it and, or should care about it. But there's, 
there's a part of it though that they have to make sure that they're paying attention to to make sure that they're staying relevant as the consumer is developing around them because I, I'll I love giving this this example of things changing around you. Um, I'm a dog. A dog stands for dad of great student. It's a program here at our elementary school. So every, at the beginning of the year, all of the dads before school starts, goes to the elementary school and we pick a day of the year where we sign up to be an assistant at the school. So you start the day in your kid's class and then you go to other classes and you tutor and you work the playground and you, and the, the whole idea of the program is to show males as a positive role model and as somebody who's parenting, right? Right. When I did it for my daughter, she's nine now, but when kindergarten, when we did it at her kindergarten and I went to her class, I sat down on the floor with, with the rest of the kids and the teacher had a smart board out there with these plastic styluses and she would write on the board and it would draw in digital ink. So if it was a green plastic stylus, it would be green digital ink. Cool. And then the, it was smart, right? And all of those notes and everything she was writing on the board was being saved online that I could go home and review later, right? Wow. And nice. then afterwards, they had this YouTube exercise thing that they did where she streamed online. And then the kids did this activity with, with an iPad and a tablet where they were doing all these kind of math problems and all this stuff, right? There's all this digital interface around them, right? Yeah. So then uh, a buddy of mine actually took a picture of his son's college class, took pictures of him when he was going to college. And one of the things he showed me the picture and he said, what do you notice about this? And I looked at it and every kid had a laptop or a tablet or a device or more than one device. And what was different is that the kids had actually already watched the lecture before they came to the class. The class oh. was actually a discussion of the lecture that they had watched online. And the professor was on a board where they were, you know, writing things on a smart board and the kids could actually type on their devices and it would show up on the board. And they were having this two way communication in this discussion. So what I say to people is I say, okay, so you're in an association or you're a corporation and you're trying to attract a uh, new talent and that student who's had this digital engagement their entire life, their entire educational career goes to your conference and they walk into a room with incandescent lighting and there's a, 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 a projector and somebody's talking to them while doing a PowerPoint. Are you speaking to them in the language that they've been speaking to each other? Right. And that's, that's where I use that example because that's, that's where companies have a hard time. They, they lose touch with how people are interacting, how people are communicating and the technology. It's not about the technology. It's what the technology enables to do for relationship and connection that they miss. It sounds like the way to stay up to date, is to immerse yourself in culture. But that's a lot harder to do if you're just not naturally immersed in the culture. That's correct. I remember I worked at a big corporation and there was some uh, data that came out that the average person drives a car that's 12 years old. Okay? Yeah. And in the United States, the average car on the road is 12 years old. And I remember the CEO at that time, he was like, that can't be true. I don't know one person who has a car older than two years old. It's like, yeah, you don't know anybody who's not a multimillionaire either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny about that is a month ago, I traded in my 2006 uh, Nissan Murano for a minivan. Fancy. We're just coming up on 12 years. There you go. <laughs> well, you just wrecked the curve again. <laughs> so this is what I would ask you as well. So, because another, there's another dynamic that we're both very familiar with, which is in esports, which yeah. is that business professionals don't get the esports space. No. You have people who've been in business 20, 30 years, and they know yep. everything about traditional marketing, yep. partnerships, PR, et cetera. And they look at not just the ecosystem esports, but they look at the consumer behavior of gamers, and they are just baffled. Yes. Why are they destroying us on Reddit? <laughs> <laughs> but 
part of why these people have been successful for 20, 30 years is because they've marketed to themselves. Yeah. So maybe something that can be a little nugget, a DLC drop, a bit of value for our audience, Donnie, that you can share with us is, hey, we're all, none of us are getting younger, right? <laughs> like I'm, I'm still pretty tied in the skateboard culture, the esports culture. I'm 38, but yeah. hey, you know, at some point I'm not going to get it right. naturally. Yeah. What can we do to stay involved and to stay immersed or to immerse ourselves in a way, in a way that we are not currently? Oh, wow. Um, it's, it's really tough. Um, I live, so where I live, we're, we're right by, um, American family insurance's headquarters. Okay. They're, they're this, their headquarters is here. So a lot of my neighbors are in the insurance industry. And when we get together riveting. for, it's, it's amazing. The, the only thing is they get to leave at nine and come back at five. And I am a little envious of that. Yeah. Um, but when we get together and we talk about, you know, um, what's going on in our lives at some point, there is a conversation about insurance and can you believe so-and-so released this product and so-and-so didn't know this and, and I'm lost, I'm lost in it. Yep. Now this is their job and this is their career and this is what they've done their whole life. So this is what they're attuned to. What I do is what I wanted to do when I grew up and what I would do, whether I was getting paid for it or not. I hope mm -hmm. Tyler doesn't hear this. Uh, <laughs> I'm texting him now. <laughs> it's one of these things that there's no way to really force people to be immersed in it. You, you either are, or you're not, you're either, you know, I, 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 I think one of my favorite things is, is when I would go to, Esports tournaments and I would take business professionals there and they'd just be blown away. They'd be blown away by look at the screens and the lights and there's pyrotechnics and all the, and there's just all the shiny object syndrome all around them. Mm -hmm. And that's what, the, and look at the, the, the branding of that sign there, or look at the lack of sponsorship and you know what we could do. We could, and they come up with all these and they're look missing at all the, the logo whole, placement opportunities. It, exactly. And they're missing the point. They're missing the entire point because it, it ain't about all that. It's about the the people who are there who are attending, who are on the floor, who are my people, mm. the, the the kid I was, you know, growing yeah. up. The 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 years of feeling um feeling foolish for being into video games and building your own computers getting your PC gamer every month and getting excited or your, or I'm going to take it away back your Nintendo power that would give you the map of how to go through like, you know, Zelda or something like right. there's this whole culture that's there that it's so much more than what's at the surface level. And, and so I guess what I would say to a lot of companies about how do you keep relevant? How do you keep immersed? If you're not part of it, then talk to somebody, talk to your kid, like talk to somebody who is a part of it and, and, and listen, I, I, I tell a lot, yeah. I, I, I tell a lot of people, you want to understand part of this, this culture, um, go on to Twitch, pick some channels and just sit there and just watch the interaction. Just watch it. Yeah. Like watch the people talking and watch the personalities do some research, find out who some of the, you know, the big personalities or go to YouTube and see Dr. Disrespect or whatever. And, and it's not watching it once. It kind of, it's like, give it a week. It's like a show. Mm -hmm. Like, don't, don't judge it on the first episode. Like get invested and just listen to it. And very, very, very slowly, but surely you're going to start seeing something there that on the surface level you didn't see before. And it's this, this communication that's going on there this conversation i think it's all about it's all about the community right yeah it's about the relationships that these folks have built through community who understand something that people outside of this community don't understand and there's a feeling when you're playing a game a certain game like you're wearing a quake hat now right so you're wearing you're playing quake there are feelings and moments and memories in quake that if you play yes. it 
you can relate to that and you talk yeah. shop, you know, inside baseball, what have you. And, you know, in skateboarding, we say, if you don't skate, you can't relate, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there, you know, I would say when you're watching those things to the audience, when you're watching these streams, don't go in with the attitude of, I don't know why anybody watches this or yeah. can you believe people watch other people play video games? Yeah. I'll tell you what I caught myself doing the other, the other day. So I'm a big time skateboarder, as a lot of people know. I, yeah. I've been skateboarding since I was 11 years old. You know, I think about it most days. I, you know, I was just in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm taking pictures, and people are like, what are you taking a picture of? I was like, oh, I'm taking a picture of that handrail over there to send to my brother to show him, like, how sick this would be <laughs> to skate. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, this guy. <laughs> so what I caught myself doing the other day, there's a, there's a podcast called The Nine Club. Mm. The Nine Club is a few pro skateboarders, a couple pro filmers, yeah. and they interview each other. So they've got the hosts, and then they'll have a guest. Well, one of the things that they started doing recently is watching a video part together mm. for the show. And so for people who don't know, skateboarding is all about video parts. You may have yeah. just seen it in the Olympics. You may see the X Games. But what true skateboarding is, it has nothing to do with competition. It has to do with expressing yourself on your skateboard, skating the streets, skating what's not meant to be skated and documenting yeah. it and then yeah. editing that and sending it to yeah. music. So I found myself so entertained, not just watching skateboarders skate. I found myself watching skateboarders watching skateboarding. <laughs> yes, 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 that's and I correct. Was, I was thinking this is so ridiculous if somebody came in and saw me on YouTube watching skateboarders watching skateboarders skateboarding Yes. But the reason why it's so interesting, number one, is I get it. But number two, the pros who have skated all these spots themselves or the filmer who's been there filming a trick, they're talking about, oh, that rail is so steep. Oh, yes. man, to get to that spot, you got to climb a fence. Security kicks you out in five minutes. Oh, the thing about that spot, oh, that ground is so rough or this, that, and the yeah. other. He did that on this. Where's that spot? Yes. They're talking to each other. They've got this inside knowledge. And it's a perfect analogy of why gamers love to watch other people play video games. It's yeah. entertainment that's relevant to you. It, there's no difference between that and when they mic up in the NFL. And you hear the players, because we all understand the game of football. We right. all understand, well, not everybody, but the majority of us <laughs> know the game of football. And <clears throat> when we hear that inside commentary, when we hear them talking to each other, and the conversation, we're fascinated by it. And it's no different. I mean, we're, when I watch Z-Langer, who's a Call of Duty master, yeah, you know, a war, Warzone master, I, I'm horrible at Warzone. I'm, I'm absolutely horrible at it. I know. But I watch him and I see what he does. Yes, you do know. <laughs> but you, you, you watch what he does and he's pulling off a 30, 40 kill run. You know how difficult that is. And then when he starts explaining how he's doing things and what he's doing and sharing all that information, it's fascinating to me. My it, wife yeah. would have no, she wouldn't care the least about it. But then when I watch her watching shows about sewing, I'm not interested by that, but I know she enjoys that. Have you I tried a double cross that... stitch? <laughs> exactly. Don't talk to me until you have. I don't know and, if that's a real stitch. But. And I think, you know, I, I often think about that because my kids, you know, I have a, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old and they play a lot of video games. Mm. And my opinion about it is much different than my parents' opinion was about me playing video games. I know Absolutely. that they're interacting with other people. Uh, my son, who's six, opened up the Roblox um, video game creator and just started teaching himself how to make games in it. And I was so proud. Awesome. <laughs> and, and I'm just thinking about a generation before us. that would be yeah. like, why are you wasting all that screen time and all that? And I'm, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this kid's going to, this kid's going to have no problem finding a job in the future. And there, I, I would say there are a lot of parents in the neighborhood I live in who have, you know, real feelings about screen time. And they didn't grow up with screens like I did. And it's, it, so it's, it's tough. I mean, obviously, I want my kids to be socially, you right. know, you know, 
Well, be I, able to I would say I would say that we should all have uh, concerns about screen time, but we should also be aware of the positive aspects of gaming. Yes. And I always say the negative aspects of gaming and esports are obvious. You know, you could have too much screen time, a sedentary yep. lifestyle, and some of yep. those games are not appropriate for the children who are playing them at times, right? Correct. Correct. However, yeah. the positives are less obvious. Yeah. And if you don't take the time to look into how this builds social skills, how yeah. uh, being on a team builds the same skills that would on a traditional sports team like baseball, basketball, football, yeah. or how just the natural skills uh, enable you to become be a better pilot for things like that. Or if you don't know that the military is dry, is flying drones with Xbox controllers, yeah. then you would not see the positive aspects of gaming. The other thing that my eyes were open to recently, I interviewed a guy with Esports Trade Association uh, who is with Microsoft. Yeah. And he helps them develop education through Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. And one thing he made a point on that I'd never thought about before is all screen time is not created equal correct so if you're doing youtube yeah. which is basically the same as tv it's mindless yeah. yes but if you're spending time in roblox or minecraft or something else overwatch where you're creating part of a team or you're creating part of a these team. other things yes your mind yeah. is working in ways that are beneficial for you yeah a lot of people don't realize that the first social media ever was video games it was the first social media platform. I remember playing Amiga 500 on my 9600 baud modem with my friend across the street. Him and I both being on the phone because they didn't have, you know, Discord back then and talking to each other while we played RTS games. Yeah, it's the modern day golf course. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And again, it's it's just it's a very hard hard thing for people to understand. It's it's all of these intangibles and all these things that we just inherently um, just know as gamers, as people who have been in it our whole life. I I will remember the first when I was when I was professionally in esports, when I was yeah. officially in esports. Um, I I remember the first tournament I ever went to was a Call of Duty tournament <clears throat> that was in Orlando and. I remember I, I connected with a bunch of esports professionals and and uh, uh, got to tag along with them. They invited me to come out and, and do it, so I came out to it. And, you know, just trying to learn and understand how the business side of this was all working. And I remember we got into, uh, we got with a team and uh, some people from ESPN and all this stuff who were all esports people. And we got into a big Suburban and I sat in the back seat. Mm -hmm. sitting in the middle and we're driving along and all of a sudden the person up front goes so uh what's the rig you play on donnie and you've told me the story yeah uh, yeah and i knew exactly what was going on they're checking I was to see a, if you're legit i was a stranger mm -hmm. i was i was i was in their territory and they wanted to find out was i in this to like go make money on this thing called esports was i a real gamer yeah. And that's when I said, well, I have a i5, a 6600K, uh, 6, overclocked to, to 4.2 on air. Uh, I got a uh, 90, what was that, a 97 uh, EVG uh, overclocked uh, video card. And they said, not the 9800. I said, it's just as fast. I've overclocked it enough. 16 gigs of memory, DDR4, you know, 2400, blah, blah, blah. You know, I have the, Sam, uh, I have the Samsung 850 Evo. A solid state for my OS, and then I have both. I went through everything, and they're like, "Oh yeah, what do you play?" Well, at the time, I was like, "Oh, I'm I'm a PUBG guy," and they're like, "PUBG? You're not Call of Duty?" I said, "I I really like the PUBG. I really been dig digging it ever since H1Z1 and blah 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 blah." And I went through all the stuff and all the games and all that stuff, and then the conversation, and then they they let go, and we just started conversating. Right. But that was my test. Yeah, that was them finding out was I legit. I knew what that was. You know, so, so it go well, ahead. My question is, because what we're experiencing a lot in the esports space is it's growing now. Right. Yeah. And I have a vested interest in this with the esports trade association is help helping people come in to the space yeah. who may not have been gamers since they're since yeah. day one. But 
have the heart to serve the community. Yeah. And do I believe that it's important for gamers to be leading gaming? Absolutely, because it keeps the space pure. It keeps it what it, for what it's about, the community, the gameplay, all of these things. But our space can be very well served yeah. by having people who have complementary expertises, who have more experience in business, Yes. In the non-gaming sides that our esports ecosystem greatly needs today. Yes. But what's most important are your intentions. And what I got to credit the esports industry with is if you don't have a big background in gaming, but you have the right intentions, you're a good person, you go to listen, learn, say, how can I help? You'll be embraced. But so people who are thinking, I want to be in this space. This is so cool. I just found out about it. Oh, I love community. I want to be part of the future of entertainment. But they couldn't pass that test that you were able to pass with flying colors. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? Um, I would tell them, you know, think about your skill sets, where you excel, and how can you apply that to the industry to move it forward? Like if you're an excellent marketer or a video editor or whatever it is, how can you take those skill sets and help these organizations be able to, you know, be able to do it better, to do yeah. it more efficient, to, to, to teach them Because remember they're gamers first, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these original people who started all these things started out as a bunch of kids hooking up computers in a, in a room right. and it just started growing and growing and growing. I mean, um, like how, how can you provide value that helps everybody else excel? And, and to your, to your point, it's, it's all about intentions. You know, the unfortunate thing is this is the same rule for any business for, for any industry is, you know, there are people who go into jobs because they want to make a lot of money. And then there are people who go into those jobs because they genuinely care. And their intentions are pure. And this, this industry is no different. I mean, this is, this is no different. It's a lot of fun. And I think a lot of people look at that too. And I think that's why it attracts a lot of people. It seems like a lot of fun, but like I'll often say, cause I get hit up all the time from people who are like, Hey, I want to get into esports, and you know, I want to get to the gaming industry. You know, wh what do you, what do you recommend? What do you suggest? And my first answer is, do you like to work for free? <laughs> because if you like to work for free, you can get into it really easily. Yeah. Because a lot of the people, um, Marcus from DreamHack, uh -huh. you know, he's the CEO of DreamHack. He started out as a volunteer for DreamHack. Right. I mean, <laughs> he, he donated his time, but he worked hard at it and he got, you know, to where he is today. And he's one of the most, you know, amazing guys, nicest guys in the world. Uh, you know, so it, it was also a lot of the, you know, attitude, not so much the, you know, it's more attitude than it is aptitude. That's the other thing too. I always tell people is it's like, if you have the right attitude. You can learn all the other stuff. You really can. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the attitude that you have in this. Um, yeah. And I think that attitude, it's an others first attitude, yeah. right? It's yeah. going to say, what can I do for you? Yeah. Building those relationships, people work with the people they know, the people they like. And when you do that, that opportunity will come. But I, I always give people the same advice. I say, hey, go volunteer at an event. Number yeah. one, they need the help. Be mm -hmm. willing to do whatever they're asking you to do. Yeah. Especially for young people, this is so valuable because you don't know what you want to do for a living. Yeah. You might think you know what you want to do for a living and you <laughs> yeah. could be like me and you could get a marketing degree and then you get a marketing job and you're like, oh, this is the day to day for marketing. Yeah. I like business development way better. <laughs> 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 and, you know, so experience the things that are out there, but also just like building the relationships and like integrating yourself into the entire ecosystem, regardless of your age, even if you're, you know, 20 years in looking to make a job change, like just go and say, hey, I'm here to help. Yeah. And nobody can hate on that. Yeah, no, no. I, I, my, the mantra that I grew up with that my mother instilled in me was if you want to make God laugh, make plans. And right. like when I think I went to school for acting, 
I got an acting degree, a BFA acting degree. Oh, breaking news stage. I'm just learning this. You heard I, it here first on the DLC Drop podcast. I was I was a child actor. My first paid job ever was was an acting gig when I was young. No way. And I, Home yeah, Alone, I, was that you? Yeah, that was me. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And and I I went to, at the time, was the number two school for undergrad for, for theater. And wow. uh, there's only like 10 of us in my degree. And it was grueling. Uh, mm -hmm. And like halfway through, I suddenly went, I don't want to be an actor. I don't want to do this. It's funny now because a lot of my friends, you know, from college, all actors and, you know, all that stuff. And I had one of my friends ask me, like, how did, how did you get into this? Like, how, how'd you, like, how'd you get a job in this side? Hmm. And, and I said, you know, everything that I learned about what I do now professionally, I all learned out of the classroom on my own time. It was all self taught. It was all the stuff I love to do in my free time. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that that curiosity and that, you know, we are multidimensional. I'm not just an actor or I'm not just, you know, a guy who works in VR. There's a lot of parts to all of us, you yes. know, and, and I think we sometimes lose sight of that. I love it when we go to like a, a conference, like we go to like an esports conference and yeah. everybody had introduced themselves by their title, you know, and I think that's one of the things I always appreciated about you is John is John. John is genuine. Appreciate and, that. and, and, yeah, what you see is what you get, and you act no differently. When I've had meetings with games as executives that we've had breakfast with <laughs> together, or when I've met a friend of yours, you know, in Dallas or whatever, John's always John. That authenticity, oh, God, I said that word, that buzzword. Oh, jeez, no. Wow. You <laughs> yeah, do you have an alarm that goes off in the, in the podcast? Uh, but, but it's, but it's, but I, but I'm, I'm serious about it, like, that is, again, if we're going back to that, um, you know, that car I was locked up in where they were grilling me, that it wasn't for show. It was genuine. It was who I, who I am. And, and in the esports industry, I'll say people are very suspect because there was such a long time where we were subjugated to teasing and to people calling us nerds before nerds were cool. Right. And there's just a lot of just a lot of stuff we had to deal with that today, all of those things are now cool. <laughs> that hey, before, I remember when you were picking me last on the basketball court. Yeah. Right? Yeah. On, yeah. And and so I will say that there's probably a there's a contention of people in esports who might have a little bit of a grudge, might have some, you know, things from childhood that they're kind of working out and now they find themselves in a position of power and they're going to let people have it. I mean, <laughs> sure. I saw it. I saw it happen. I saw, I saw it plenty of times, but um, that's, that's the exception. That's not the rule. And I, I think that a lot of the people who I, who I met in, in the gaming and esports industry, uh, who I continue to meet, you know, because now in my job, I'm working with a lot of the, the platforms on real unity the developers, the, the people actually creating this, you know, right. these environments. Um, the people who I just naturally am attracted to are the people who are just real. You can see how much they love what they do. You can see that they're going, can you believe this? Like, can, yeah. you see, can, can you believe what they're paying us to do now? And that's, that's the part that I don't know. I, I, I had a, a college professor uh, I directed a show and there was a guest director from the Milwaukee Repertory Theater who was, who was doing the main stage show and I was doing the student show and I was told by the dean of the school, of the theater school, well, you realize you won't have any of the A actors, so you, I don't know how you're going to do your show with whatever's left over. I mean, it was basically that was the message and I was really bummed and my professor, Dr. Margolis, she said to me, Donnie, surround yourself by the people that you love. You know, I have nothing but success. Hmm. And that year, my show won best actor, best actress, best show, best director. And, and I so. did. I casted people who I really admired. And yeah. we collaborated and we worked together. And we did this really 
heavy drama three act <laughs> show that was really intense and we pulled it off, but we all enjoyed it and we all enjoyed working together. That was a huge lesson I learned. I mean, in my whole career, like the people I worked with at, at, at PRG, I still talk to to this day all the time. I'm still very close with them. And the, the, my first boss, CEO at Broadjam, Roy, to this day is still one of my good friends. Who I still ask him advice. Never burnt any bridges any place I left, you know? And I think that also helps in this whole thing. You know, uh, our mutual friend, Dan Ciccone, I can call him at any time. <laughs> you know, Unless get he's his... in Italy for three months because COVID yeah, happened when he was out there. That too. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> there's that too. But like any of these people, you know, yeah. and, and I think, you know, in, in the esports industry, that network, that, you know, just all of those resources and also having a lot of people who didn't come from the industry. But when, when a problem would arise or a challenge would arise, I would go, I know who to call. Mm-hmm. I know exactly who to call who can help out with this. Right. You know, so. Well, and you said a lot of nice things about a lot of people, and there's a lot of great things to say about yourself as well. I remember uh, being, I think it was at the Esports Awards uh, a couple of years ago with Dan Ciccone, and it was the show before the show where they were giving out the Lifetime Achievement Awards. Yeah. Now, one of my jokes about esports is it's the only industry that gives out Lifetime Achievement Awards to 40-year-olds. <laughs> 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 um, but... Um, Hector, Sundance, and DJ Wheat were all getting awards there. And so oh, Dan cool. has been Hector Rodriguez X agent, uh, has been his agent, uh, CEO of Optic Gaming. And yeah. somebody asked how me and Dan knew each other. They're like, oh, Donnie Newfus. And this person's like, who's Donnie Newfus? And Dan was explaining who you are. And he was like, well, he's just the nicest guy in the world. Like, you can't help but love Donnie. Just like, and you know, you explain how you guys met and all these things. And um, so, you know, a lot of the wonderful people that are around you have to do with what a wonderful person you are, Donnie. So I appreciate that, man. I, I really do. I really do. It's, uh, you know, I, I am one of those guys, honestly, who's going, can you believe what I do? <laughs> like one of these days, they're going to figure me out. And uh, I'm, I, you know, I feel very fortunate, very fortunate that um, I think my my 12-year-old self would be pretty happy with my 43-year-old self. That's amazing. Well, we have like three, four, five minutes left here. And yeah. one thing that I wanted to touch on really quick, I yeah. have to do another episode to, to dive in super deep. But one of the things that I know about you being the complex individual you are with many aspects because we are good friends is a couple times a week. I get a late night text from Donnie Newfus and it is a track and it is the hottest fire that I have heard anybody spit. And so my friend Donnie Newfus here, not only is a technology strategist and an esports expert and a great father, but he is also a hip hop artist. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I, uh, it's funny because before I decided on what I was going to go to school for, I was either going to go to school for music, you know, or acting because both of those careers are so, you know, uh, you know, substantial at earning money. Right. Yeah. And like uh, fish in a barrel is what I hear. <laughs> and I decided, I decided I, I had been a musician. I had been uh, playing drums since I was four years old and, oh, wow. and, as a drummer, I really like beats. Mm-hmm. And when I was growing up, there was this thing called hip hop that was happening in the eighties. I mean, I knew it was happening b- before that, but when I was getting exposed to it, I really just latched onto it and I loved it. And then I started in high school being in a bunch of bands and then always gravitating towards hip hop. And like my favorite band in the world to this day is still rage against the machine which is a culmination all of, my sponsor of, me tapes when I was in high school that I would make, yeah. I used Rage against the machine. Yeah. As yeah. A just, yeah. just brilliant, brilliant. And so when I went off to college, I couldn't bring my drum set with me. And, uh, I met a bunch of guys who good, good friends who we would go out for adult beverages and then come back and we would put on P funk. And we had one of those Iowa stereo systems that you could remove the vocals and yeah. we would all freestyle in the dorms. And 
one day I got introduced to this software called Acid Pro uh-huh. and I learned how to make beats and I just started producing hip hop. And so, uh, and I started practicing like seriously at it. And, uh, and to this day, it is my, it's my release. I, uh, I make the kids pancakes and bacon in the morning on Saturday. Yep. And there, I make sure they're all good. And they're with their cartoons. I grab my coffee. I go down to my recording studio and I produce hip hop. And I've been writing, I've actually been writing for the last 15 years with the same two guys and, uh, produce a lot of artists and, I've had stuff on syndicated radio and it's just this secret little thing that I've done forever that I just, uh, it's my creative outlet. It's, I love it. It's what I love doing. And, and I appreciate there's so few people who know that I do this. So, I mean, so few people. Well, and now that you've you're been one on of the podcast, I mean, get ready <laughs> yeah. to rake in the money, my friend. You know, I <laughs> yeah. guess you've made it twice now. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and, and again, I mean, you want to talk about a, a community and a culture yeah. that is like, you know, <laughs> there's so much stuff there that a lot of people don't understand surface level. I mean, that is for sure. You know, I, I you know, we we would always joke in the esports industry is you can tell a lot of, about a person by the game they play. Mm. You know, those Dota two players, pretty smart, smart people. Yeah, you know, and those Call of Duty guys, they're bros. You know. Uh, it would be the same. It's the same thing in hip hop. I mean, the hip hop that you listen to, the music you make is a huge way to, um, kind of identify your personality and who you are. And so, uh, I'm a big rhyme sayers guy, you know, I'm Midwest. I I grew up with slug and dance and atmosphere and brother Ali and all that, you know, that's, that's what I grew up Aspie rock and all that stuff. That's, that's what I gravitate towards, but you know, it's, it's the same thing. It's just, another layer of the personality so love it well and number one this is not a joke like donnie is legit amazing uh with his tracks and so uh, where can people tune in to hear some of that stuff all right well i feel like i could talk to you all day long my friend and we have some very long conversations on the phone it's it's fun to record this conversation with you uh, but before i let you go how can people follow you uh, regarding your music, uh, anything else you'd like, and how can people follow Sonic Foundry to keep up to date with that as well? Yeah, well, um, as far as uh, if you wanna if you wanna find us, um, I, I'm very easy to find because this is an actual fact. I am the only Donnie Newfus in the United States Registry. I'm the only person who has the name. So you can just <laughs> literally find me on um, Facebook, uh, Instagram. I go by D O double W I. Uh, Instagram is generally where I'm putting the music or Thanks. pictures of my kids from Halloween. Um, as far as finding Sonic Foundry, you can find us at uh, sonicfoundry.com. Uh, follow our uh, Facebook and all that. Um, Find me on LinkedIn if you want to talk. That's also a great way to get a hold of me. And again, Donnie Newfis. I'm the only Donnie Newfis there. So, um, but I encourage if anybody, you know, if anybody has questions, one thing that I've always offered um, when I meet people who are interested, I am more than happy to set up calls and talk with people. And I, I enjoy that. So I welcome it. Definitely. I don't know if I'll be any help, <laughs> but I'll sure try. I think you will be. You, you've helped me a lot, and uh, I know you've helped a lot of others. Um, uh, thanks. Appreciate you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for joining me today on this episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future I Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review. 